Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8.16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8.31 I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, the deadline is upon us. Despite deceptive reports that Iran has halted higher grade uranium enrichment, Israel believes that the hardline Islamic Republic can have a nuclear weapon within weeks. According to a report released last week by the Institute for Science and International Security, Iran could have enough weapons grade uranium to make a nuclear bomb in less than a month. A former senior official from the International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed this estimate and said that Tehran has already reached the point of no return. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded to the report, saying the Iranians have made improvements in the past year, which allow them to jump over the barrier of 20 percent enrichment and proceed directly to 90 percent enrichment within weeks at most. A representative from the Palestinian Authority has reportedly leaked information about the negotiations with Israel to news outlets. This source detailed what he claims are the PA's demands, including insistence that any exchange of land with Israel not exceed 1.9 percent of the West Bank. That would amount to less than half of the territory necessary to incorporate the majority of Jewish residents of the area. The source also told a local Israeli television channel that the Palestinians insist on full control of water resources, as well as border crossings on what would be their side of the Dead Sea, the release of all Palestinians held in Israeli jails, and that all Palestinian refugees and their descendants be given the option of returning to Israel or the Palestinian state as part of a final status agreement. The Israeli cabinet voted to approve the release of 26 Palestinian terrorists. The action is intended to be a goodwill gesture as Israel hopes to move forward in peace negotiations with the Palestinian Authority. Their release comes after a wave of violent Palestinian terrorist attacks on Israeli citizens. The cabinet also approved giving back the bodies of several notorious Palestinian suicide bombers, including Mahmoud Kawasme, who murdered 17 people in a bus bombing in Haifa in March of 2003 and is Aldin Shukhail al-Masri, who detonated a suicide bomb in the Subaru restaurant in downtown Jerusalem in August of 2001. The Israeli prison services notified the family members of the 27 victims of the prisoners to be freed. They were given time to appeal the decision. Israeli citizens and several members of Knesset fought to block the release, saying it was giving incentive to terrorist attacks. More than 3,500 Israelis attended a vigil outside the Ofer prison protesting the scheduled freeing of the Palestinian terrorist. Relatives held pictures of loved ones lost in terrorist attacks, and they prayed for the prisoner release to be canceled. The Palestinian security prisoners were given a hero's welcome upon their release from Israeli prisons and welcomed with parades, parties, and a formal reception at the presidential compound in Ramallah. Each terrorist who returned to Judea and Samaria was given a wreath to lay at the tomb of former PLO leader Yasser Arafat. Many prisoners freed in previous releases have returned to terror-related activities. And according to an Israeli security source, the move results in an increased number of shooting incidents and the throwing of Molotov cocktails at Israelis in the territories. The source also noted a spike in general violence and terror activity following such releases. Three Muslims have been arrested for brutally attacking a Jewish family in Australia. According to news reports, a gang of eight Muslims targeted the Jewish family as they were walking home from the synagogue on Shabbat. The men screamed hateful slogans at them and beat them in the streets of Sydney. 
The authorities are treating the crime as racially motivated and are investigating the incident. Several Hamas terrorists have been arrested by Palestinian Authority security services in Hebron after the discovery of a plot to launch unmanned aerial vehicles armed with explosives at Israel. According to the reports, the Hamas cell was based at the city's university, and the operatives have already conducted multiple test flights of the drone aircraft. On two previous occasions this year, the Lebanon-based Hezbollah terror group has flown UAVs into Israeli territory for the purposes of gathering intelligence. The city of Jerusalem will host the first conference on femicide and bring to light the targeting and murder of women. The Femicide Conference, which is sponsored by an intergovernment framework for European cooperation in science and technology, intends to expose violent crimes against women around the world. According to the event's organizers, one woman is killed every hour by someone she is romantically involved with. Dr. Shalava Weil, a senior researcher at Hebrew University, will chair the conference in Jerusalem. Dr. Weil said this is the first conference on femicide in Europe and the issue is on the rise. IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Benny Gantz has approved the appointment of the first Druze officer to command the respected Golani Brigade. Colonel Rasan Aliyan will now head the Infantry Brigade after having previously served as commander of the 36th Division on the Golan Heights. Upon his official posting, Alian will become the second Druze officer to command an infantry brigade in the IDF. Israel's Arabic-speaking Druze community numbers over 100,000 and is based on the religious observance of Shiite Islam. The governors of Texas and Nevada were in Israel last week to participate in the Water Technology and Environmental Control Conference in Tel Aviv. Both Rick Perry and Brian Sandoval lead states that are starved for water and they believe that they can benefit from Israeli water technologies. Governor Perry said it is fitting that this conference is held in Israel because it faces some special challenges in a lot of different ways, but certainly from the standpoint of water. Texas faces many of those same challenges that Israel faces today. Perry went on to say we must strive to use new technologies to conserve and expand the supplies of fresh water. Governor Sandoval said, you see the success story of what has come out of the desert here in such a short time. He said Israel's success has given him hope that he can do something for the great state of Nevada. Each governor was accompanied by a 50-member delegation, which included officials from public water utilities and regional authorities, as well as a range of corporate and academic leaders in the water sector. A new bill proposed in the Knesset would allow Israeli fathers to take paternity leave including eight paid days off work immediately after their baby's births. Member of Knesset Tamar Zandberg, who sponsored the legislation, noted that Israel has the highest birth rate in the Western world. And while the country has made great progress in terms of women's rights during pregnancy and birth, fathers' rights should also be incorporated. Parenthood, says Zandberg, is the joint right of both parents and that her bill would enable fathers to help care for their children by fostering a connection with them as early as possible. If you are a Christian lover of Zion and you believe that this beautiful land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel, then go to loversofzion.com to learn about strengthening Israel now with Chizuk Now. Hear this video excerpt. Now what I'm about to say to you is very important, so please listen closely. Consider this. The areas of Judea and Samaria that have the strongest Jewish presence are in the least danger of being lost to us. This is why the communities of Ariel and Malay Adumim are in the least danger of being lost to the Jewish state. And that concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful rooftop studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Willem Grafume, Executive Director of the Israel Allies Foundation. Willem, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Josh. Well, tell our viewers a little bit about what is the Israel Allies Foundation. 
The Israel Allies Foundation is the umbrella organization uh, to support, provide activity for, uh, activate uh, Israel Allies caucuses around the world. We have 25 caucuses in 25 countries, uh, mainly made up of Christian members of parliament. We have over 700 politicians that we're working with. Uh, and we work with these people to help them help their countries be more pro-Israel. Why are Christian politicians standing with Israel? Christian politicians like myself, I'm a Christian, uh, support Israel because they want to be part of something that God is doing. And they see in the Bible repetitively God returning the Jewish people to Israel, God blessing Israel. And of course, we want as Christians to join God in what he's doing. So we are standing with God with Israel. What are the, some of the main issues that the Israelites Foundation take up in the parliaments around the world? The Israel Allies Foundation mainly addresses issues that are connected to our faith. So we deal with issues like recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, standing with uh, biblical support of Judea and Samaria. You know, this is an historic effort because there are many lobbies out there, but this is the first that is actually a caucus. What differs this organization from the lobby organizations? First of all, we're not a Jewish organization. So most of the lobby organizations, in fact, almost all of them are Jewish. We are not a Jewish organization. We're not a Christian organization, but we are Jews and Christians working together to support Israel. You know, faith-based diplomacy has become a catchphrase in Israel. People believe that this is really the secret to successful diplomacy. Why do you think it works? It works because people are passionate about issues that, me, uh, that are, you know, are deep in their faith. And so support for Israel is something that's deeply connected to our faith. And so just like the pro-life issue or pro-family issues, this is an issue that Christians can really identify with and their countries stand with or against Israel has a huge effect on those, on those nations. Last month in Jerusalem, you had a chairman's conference that brought the chairman of these caucuses from around the world together. But next month, you're having the Washington Conference, which is really bringing hundreds of pastors together with congressmen and Christian political leaders. What's the significance of the Washington Conference? The Washington Conference is significant because the first uh, Israel Allies Caucus that was formed in 2006 uh, as part of this network of politicians was the Congressional Israel Allies Caucus in the U.S. Congress. And so, Many of our other caucuses have, have asked us to learn from uh, what is happening in Washington. And it's also a great opportunity for us to bring together Christian leaders and Christian uh, grassroots like yourself to come and join together with these politicians to learn about how to advocate for Israel and their governments. It is well known that the Christian grassroots in America is really the backbone of the Republican Party. You can't get elected in the Republican Party if you don't have the Christian grassroots. And so there's a lot of pro-Israel support there. Do you envision that this type of organization will happen in countries around the world so that their parliamentarians and their politicians will be pro-Israel? Absolutely. We are already seeing it. We, we have you know, caucuses in 25 nations. And these caucuses are all multi-party or bipartisan in the case of two parties. Uh, I think that this will continue to expand. I, I envision 40, 50 caucuses around the world. One of the most important initiatives that you're taking on is stopping the boycott of Judea and Samaria by the European Union. How do you think you'll be able to affect this uh, very anti-Israel legislation? First of all, we, of course, are working within the European Union. Uh, we have a caucus there and in the European member states that are part of uh, the EU. Uh, to try to prevent this boycott from going into effect. But more than that, we are working with our powerful allies uh, of Israel and of Europe, uh, like the United States, Canada, uh, and other countries, to put pressure on the EU, saying, wait a second, this is unacceptable. So we work with our members uh, of Parliament, our members of Congress, for instance, our members of the Congressional Israel Allies Caucus, sent a strong letter to the EU Foreign Minister, uh, Catherine Ashton, protesting strongly this uh, implementation of a boycott. You know, one of the major issues here is the threat of a nuclear Iran. Is the foundation doing anything to tackle that issue? Absolutely. We are working again in many of these countries where Iran has a presence. And we are working to uh, expose that presence, to expose their uh, network of financial uh, back doors to bypass sanctions to prevent them from having the ability to do business around the world, preventing them from uh, having the money to be able to continue their nuclear ambitions. One of the issues that was tackled recently is the issue of the UNRWA refugees. Why is that such an important issue to Israel? That's an important issue because today there are something like 6 million, 7 million refugees under the UNRWA books. And uh, this number is up from the original uh, 400 or 500,000 uh, refugees in 1948, 1967. 
Uh, and this number will continue to grow. They project that there will be something like 25 million refugees in a few years. And so uh, that's an unsustainable number. Our Western uh, countries are supporting UNRWA wholly, and therefore we cannot afford to continue supporting refugees, let's say, 100 years after the, the original event. There are only 30,000 original refugees left. And so this uh, UNRWA issue needs to be solved and it needs they, the people there need to have a permanent home somewhere. And so it's very important as the countries who are funding this effort to, uh, to provide a solution. Well, and there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I would like to appeal to every Christian uh, that is watching to participate in raising your voice in support of Israel. And how can you do that? visit our website, look at our organization, help us get started in your country if we're not there already, help support the politicians that are in your country, that are members of, of the caucuses in our network, uh, work with us to, to push them to support the legislation that is necessary to, to uh, build a strong relationship with Israel, and come to our events. We have an event in November in Washington, uh, again, to interact these members of parliament, members of Congress with you. Uh, it's November 12th through 14th in Washington, so we encourage you to come. Thank you, Willem, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. It is heartbreaking to learn that there are over 40,000 abortions in Israel every year, many of which are due to financial concerns. The Efrat organization saves the lives of thousands of Jewish children each year by providing support to pregnant women in distress. Please help us save thousands more. This is Jerusalem, Israel's capital city. It's an ancient and modern treasure that is beyond belief. There's a little bit of Israel in all of us. Come find the Israel in you. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. Throughout the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Palestinian representatives and their supporters have systematically used the UN's main institutions to launch high-profile investigations against Israel for alleged war crimes. However, these charges have been proven time and again to be false. Example number one. In April 2002, after Israel was struck with a wave of suicide bombing attacks, Israeli troops entered the Jenin refugee camp in the West Bank, described by Palestinians as the capital of suicide attacks. Palestinian leaders accused Israel of carrying out a massacre. The massacre in Jenin and the massacre in the old city of Nablus. Saeb Arikat called for an international commission of inquiry and claimed at least 500 Palestinians were killed. Yasser Abedrabu contended that among the 500, many were women and children. The UN took the Palestinian leaders at their word. Secretary General Kofi Annan spoke about grave violations by the IDF and dispatched UN investigators. Yet, after the damage caused to Israel's reputation, the UN investigation concluded that the accusations were false. There was never a massacre in Jenin. Example number two. In December 2008, after constant Palestinian rocket fire on Israel, the Israel Defense Forces entered Gaza in an attempt to protect its southern cities. Palestinians accused Israel of deliberately targeting civilians. A fact-finding team appointed by the UN Human Rights Council and headed by Justice Richard Goldstone initially accepted the Palestinian accusations. However, Justice Goldstone later retracted the main claim against Israel. Example number three. In May 2010, the Israeli Navy stopped a flotilla of six ships on their way to Gaza. Israel was accused of imposing an illegal naval blockade and denying civilians access to food and humanitarian aid. 
UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon empowered the Palmer Commission to investigate the claims. The Palmer report concluded that the blockade was legal under international law and that there was no humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Moreover, Israel did not block humanitarian aid from entering Gaza by land. In the month prior to the flotilla alone, over 17,000 tons of aid entered Gaza. The markets of Gaza were, in fact, full of fresh produce. These are just three well-known examples. The Palestinians' fabrications against Israel have been proven time and again to be a systematic abuse of international institutions aimed at discrediting and delegitimizing the state of Israel. However, hijacking the agenda of the United Nations by Palestinians comes with a price. As early as November 2006, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan criticized the UN Human Rights Council. Since the beginning of their work, they have focused almost entirely on Israel, and there are other crisis situations like Sudan, where they have not been able to say a word. The systematic exploitation of international humanitarian law by Palestinians comes at the expense of others in need. It erodes the credibility of UN bodies, and it must come to an end. Anywhere else, this would be a vacation by a lake. But this is the Sea of Galilee. The wonders of Israel are beyond belief. There's a little bit of Israel in all of us. Come find the Israel in you. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. We are here at the Israeli Knesset, the parliament of the state of Israel. Just a few days ago, the Israeli cabinet around Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made another important decision to allow the segment and a group of the Pnei Menashe to return back to Israel. For the International Christian Embassy, this has been an exciting project to be involved with over the last couple of months. And we want to invite you today to become part, writing a new page of the modern day story of the nation of Israel. In the late 1970s, a few individuals from a small group located in Northeast India began to research the origins of their religious traditions and their ancestry. Their research led them to discover an ancestral connection to Israel. Under Persian rule, their ancestors traveled through the Silk Route to modern-day Afghanistan, Tibet, China, and finally to Northeast India, in the midst of Myanmar and Bangladesh. This particular group, called the Bene Menashe, or Sons of Menashe, are believed to be descendants from the lost tribe of Manasseh. In the early 1980s, members of the group made contact with an organization in Israel, expressing an interest in returning to their ancient homeland. Through the faithful giving of Christian partners from around the world, the ICEJ was able to provide air transportation for 200 members of the first group of this wave of Bonnet Menashe as they made their way back to their ancient homeland in Israel. Living today in the northern coastal city of Akko, many of the Bonnet Menashe who came at that time are now well integrated into Israeli society and their children enrolled in Israeli schools. At this year's Feast of Tabernacles celebration, presented by the ICEJ in Jerusalem, two representatives of the Bnei Menashe, together with Michael Freund, the Israeli government point man overseeing the return of the Bnei Menashe, 
were able to express their thanks to the many Christians who had shown their support by giving to this special project. Thank you for, uh, for everything. And I never in my dream think that I will do my, I'll, I'll celebrate my Sukkot like this. We are privileged to be living in an era when those ancient words are coming to life, coming off the page of the Bible and walking in front of us. I used to wonder, Jews going home to Israel, it's a great story, but what does it have to do with Christians? But Isaiah chapter 49, verse 22, God says that you, the nations, you will carry us, our sons and our daughters, back to this land. If it's good enough for the prophet Isaiah, it's good enough for me. So please, keep carrying us with your prayers. Keep carrying us with your love. Keep carrying us with your support. After the Israeli government made this decision to allow more Pnei Menashe to return back to Israel, the International Christian Embassy decided to help the first group of 200 sons of Menashe to return back to Israel within this year 2013. That means we urgently need your help and your support in order to accomplish that. To bring 200 people back means we need $300,000 in this coming weeks. If you want to support one person to come back, it would cost $1,500. I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider to sponsor this end time mission to help the return of the Jewish people back to their homeland. And remember, we are your embassy here in Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. To learn more about this special project and the ICEJ, or to make a donation, visit our website at www.icej.org. Those who dreamed about the Jewish state, those who wrought the historical miracle, and against all odds established a state. Those who arrived in the homeland to their new home. Those who propelled Israel forward, step after step. I have no doubt that this expanded partnership with our many Christian supporters will greatly strengthen Israel in the years ahead. And I want to thank you all for being part of that historic effort and that historic partnership. May God bless all of Israel's friends throughout the world. May God bless you. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates. Thank you.